Welcome, everyone. It's great to uh, uh, be able to bring to, I guess, our stage to, for us today is Dr. Diane Hatchett. Um, I consider her a great friend in education and uh, a leader uh, uh, amongst our, educator, our educators uh, in our state, in our Commonwealth. And Diane, at this time, uh, Dr. Hatchett, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, what I want to do today is pick up where I left off on and talking about strategies to help students um, achieve and to level the playing field with equity. And so basically, I want to start off with a menu of options because I feel like all kids need options just like adults in order to be successful. Nothing can be one size fits all. And kids have to see the relevance in things in order for them to take ownership. Because if they can't see the connection, you know, why should they do it? I mean, I remember sitting in class as a student, being in geometry class and thinking, why am I going to, why do I need to know this? You know, and so you had to make those connections and give kids choices. So one of the things I had, if you look, it says, if students don't see the relevance in the ownership, how can we expect them to embrace their opportunities and seize the process for the taking? We want them to seize that process. When I speak about opportunities, I mean such things as passion projects and certificates, internships, mentorships, and apprenticeships. Those are some of the things that we're trying to do right now with our Pinnacle Academy. We're partnering with the city of Berea and uh, High Street Yale and local businesses and Frankfurt Independent, Madison County Schools, Fayette County Schools. And we even have an international uh, Pollard you know, school in China, in China, as well as an academy in Korea that we're partnership, partnering with because we want our kids to have those options. We want things to be meaningful and value added, not just everyday run of the mill stuff. Kids get bored easy, just like we do. That doesn't mean, but the question is, just because it's meaningful to me or to you, does that mean it's meaningful to students? We need to figure out what it is that's gonna connect to our kids. So think about the voices that you are trying to reach and trying to support and the biases that you might have. You know, I love Mexican food, uh, um, but I can't stand like ranch dressing or something like that. If I were gonna get um, an enchilada or something and it had ranch dressing, I wouldn't want it. Think about the kids when you're giving them an assignment or you're placing them into classes. Is it something that they really want? Everybody needs to have something that's going to fit them. And you can't assume a lot of times guidance counselors, when I was a guidance counselor, I would think that I knew what was best for my kids, but I would have to talk to them about what is it they liked? What is it, what their goals were, what they have wanted to achieve and kind of, it always goes back to knowing your child, knowing the student. If you know the student, you can point them in the right direction. If you don't, and you're just making assumptions and you're placing somebody in a class that you think is going to be best for them or a pathway that you think they need to be in and you don't include them in that process, then you're always spinning your wheels. The same thing with these uh, internships. It should all be about what the kids are passionate about because then you're, you're truly going to have buy-in. So right now I'm still experiencing technical difficulties. So bear with me a little bit. It's about establishing a culture of high expectations. And there has to be consistent message from teachers, administrators, the whole school, that students will succeed. And that means that you know, they have opportunity and access. Relationships have to be genuine. And there has to be that, that respect for students and a belief, a true belief in what they're capable of doing. And high expectations start with the teacher and the student relationships. From the moment the kids walk into the building, when you're greeting them at the doorway, when they're coming into the classroom, or you see them in the hall and you open that door, get to know your kids. You know, even as a superintendent, I have a superintendent advisory council. So I have the kids that I meet with every month. But outside of that, when I'm in and out of the classrooms, I'm still trying to make those connections. And no matter what level you are, we need to know our kids as much as we can and try to understand them and our teachers. Give examples, you know, for our teachers to work with our kids or some things like surveying student interests, taking those student interest surveys, calling students by name, engaging in mentoring. We're blessed in our district because our middle school and high school students all have mentors as part of the summit learning platform. Now we're trying to get that mentoring at our elementary level. Um, but at the end of the day, it's knowing your kids, thinking outside the box, encouraging people to take risks, your teachers to be innovative and to give constructive 
feedback to our kids and think about the outside resources that we can bring in and always include that praise, but make it sure that it's meaningful. Don't just praise somebody for the sake of saying you're doing a good job. Be specific. You know, we need to get our teachers to do that when they're talking to our kids. Um, and make sure that we're promoting those passion projects and having a growth munch mindset. And that means, you know, not, not always thinking about what you can't do, but what you can do. There's never should be a reason why you can't do something if you think hard enough. There's always a will. Where there's a will, there's a way. You know, you got to have a can-do attitude. There, just, and, and you can't just give up. Never, ever give up. We got to make sure that our kids have opportunities, as many as, as we can provide. And those real-life experiences are the ways that we can make those connections with rigor, with relevance, and relationships. Mentors help that, especially when you have people that are actually in the field and that are working with you. We've got people that we're teaming with now for our Pinnacle Academy from Canada and all over the United States, you know, and even in other countries, just because we want to give our kids that opportunity that they might not otherwise get with the career pathways and understanding the challenges of being culturally responsive. You know how uh, we all know how hard it is when you go into a room if you don't see somebody like yourself. You know, kind of like, okay, well, it, it, it means a lot for kids to see themselves and for somebody to be able to relate to them. It even shows that research shows that it improves test scores and improves self-esteem, the likelihood of success at a later age and at that current state. And not just for the kids who are children of color or have gender identity issues, but for all kids, because we got to prepare our kids to be successful in the real world. That is, is a key, one of the important things we had to focus on. Strategies for student engagement means getting away the getting rid of the way we used to do things. Some things we hold on to, but if it but we can't just hold on things for the sake of, of doing it. It's just like being in the classroom teaching English and having your favorite novel and knowing that that novel is not no longer something that kids need to be reading. They might be obsolete and you need to move forward. It's engaging students versus chasing a, a, a score it's che or checking a box for compliance. It goes beyond a student's permanent record. It means just getting to actually talking to your kids, asking them questions, truly getting to know their family, their history and their experiences. Like I said, calling a student by their preferred name, uh, having ability-based groups for work, group work, seeking multiple perspectives. Um, just thinking outside the box and allowing it to be a safe place, providing specific directions for successful assignment completion, using a grading rubric that communicates expectations, but also allows for some interpretation, providing individual help and differentiating learning to meet student choice, formative and summative assessments to provide critical thinking, problem solving and evaluating. There's all kinds of things that we can do to help our students be successful using still students' cultural experiences in daily instruction is huge, embracing native language and students' families as assets, and creating a classroom environment that represents all students, communicating clear expectations to everyone across the board, no matter who they are, advocating and providing supports for the whole child, physically, mentally, the whole child, whether behaviorally, empowering children to capitalize on their uniqueness, because every child is unique and an individual all to themselves. Um, I talked to um, some middle schoolers last week and they were trying to find themselves. We were working, it was an after school program and they were creating a, a design and they were making gifts to give away because we talked about the importance of when you help other people, it helps not only that person, but actually it helps you feel better. And it was one of the things we were doing for um, social and emotional learning. And we had an artist come in to help us. And so like while we were talking though and working on the project, the kids were asking like, do you really think I need to be here? Am I supposed to be here? Why am I here? Do, and they were talking about not being like, like in school, they meant being in this world. And I told them, I said, all of you guys are here for a reason. And I said, and each one of you are special and unique. And they were comparing themselves. They were talking about their, their map scores and like, and whether or not they were any good based on that score. So they were putting their hope, their identity on a score and how well they succeeded on that test. And I told them, there's more to it than the, what the score reflects. Did you give it your best shot? Did you try your hardest? You know, 
And, and so we, we had a lot of different conversations. And when I told them that they were unique, they're like, unique? Nobody's ever told me that, one of the kids said. And I said, yes, you're unique. You're your own person. You, you know, everybody has different gifts and talents. And we started talking about that. And so it's just taking those opportunities to let the children know that it's important um, to just be themselves and that they all have different things that they bring to the table and foster that love for diversity. And we talked about the importance of um, having expectations for oneself, but not comparing oneself to others. And so that's what they were wanting to do. They were wanting typical middle school. They were wanting to look at what their friends were scoring and how that how they measured up. And they were talking about not being invited to this or that or getting invited up too much. And like they had like, I had the extremes at that table. So they were all sharing their different experiences. But at the end of the day, they got to see what they had in common. And that, and that was, that was important. I felt like it was important because they seemed like they, they were talking about, they felt better and they wanted me to come back the next week and do the art project with them. <laughs> and so I've been invited to come tomorrow. Then we talk about three to one supports in our district. And to us, that means like, let's say I have a, a student who um, is not doing well in terms of attendance, maybe. Well, Having three to one supports means meeting those to, to that child's needs academically, behavioral, socially, and emotionally. Finding out what is it? Why aren't why isn't that child coming to school? Is it something that has to do with their behavior? Is there something are they getting in trouble a lot and they just want to avoid it? Or are they struggling academically? We're looking at their grades. Well, we'll have the gotten it, or is it something that maybe that's going on at home or something they've got going on? One way you could do this is like, um, you could have a student in there, you'd have a guidance counselor, family resource center, the DPP, um, if it was a special needs uh, student, their case manager, their mentor, all the students that would could provide them with supports and that that child had a connection to. And so that way, if the child needed to, like for follow-up, you've got everybody in the loop to provide them that extra layer of support. Maybe it's something as simple as they forgot to bring their notes in and it's in their locker and they can go get it. Or maybe it is something where they're having trouble in a specific class and their mentor can intervene or help them out. But it's look, finding out who the person is that that child feels most comfortable with and putting everybody in the loop to try to help them to succeed. Making those connections is always important. So you gotta know your student and what you can do to help them take them to the next level. It's not hard. It's just a matter of, of getting to know your kids. A student has to be at the center of everything we do. They had to be the motivation of why we're here. I mean, that's why, to me, why we exist. You know, we need to name and claim our students and students need to name and claim what their opportunities are in order to be motivated, engaged and ready to learn. And they need to know what their, they need to hear from us, what it is that we can bring to them. I know we had a meeting recently with some of our students um, at the high school and we asked them, what is it that you need from us? How can we help you to be successful? We talked to them and we first we introduced all of our we introduced ourselves. We had the school comment team, they introduced themselves and what they could bring to the table. We had um, each one of them speak up. The principal, the high school principal, talked about his role in the district and what he could bring to the table. The family resource center person, youth service center director, talked about her role and what she could offer. And I talked about what I could offer as superintendents. And then we turned it back to them as a superintendent. I turned it back to them and said, what is it? that you need from us. You've heard our different roles. Now, what is it that we can do to help you succeed and how can we take you to the next level? And so one of the things that they said they wanted was makerspace, you know? And so we've made that happen for them. It's about trying to get, listening to them, hearing their voice and trying to work side by side because we want them to be motivated and they were really excited about it. We've got our librarian, a media specialist on board. And it's an exciting time. Our 21st century director, she was there as well. And she's doing all kinds of incredible things. We let the kids design it. And it's just, you know, allowing them to have those quick wins and knowing that their voice matters. It has to be about relevancy. If students don't embrace and see, seize the process, then is it really meaningful? We should ask ourselves if it has value to the educator or is it to the student? Yeah, we could tell the kids what we thought they needed, but that wouldn't do any good. We want to hear it from them. Um, who is it that they're actually that we're actually trying to cater to or engage or capture the intention of? It's our students, correct? Are we trying to satisfy or what the palate of the adults or the kids, the parents or the students? 
We're, we all have to be in this together, but it's, it goes back to that restaurant of having those menus. And I might like filet mignon, but the, tea, but the student might rather have cheeseburgers. So what good is it going to do to serve filet mignon to a child when they would need the cheeseburger? So it's about opportunities, having those interviews, empathy interviews, interest surveys, just finding out about the, the student, passion projects, um, and certificates. We need to like, like right now we have an opportunity in our district with 13 career pathways, experts in the field utilizing a co-teaching model and applied learning projects. This opens the door for a lot of kids to try different things. So that way we can meet their needs, but we know we can't do this stuff by ourselves. It's all about partnerships and knowing our kids. There's no way we could do it without that. But you always have to keep the student in the center. If like one of the pictures that I have, if you notice, it has students at the heart because that is how I see our organizational chart. I know it's not traditional, but it's the way I see things because I always want the child to be the center of everything we do and have those extra layers of support. And so like the next layer beside the students, if you notice on our chart, we've got the family and the community, teachers, our classified staff, and then it branches back out to our counselors, our school psychs. And then we've got our instructional coaches, our, our principals, and, and it just keeps growing. Our curriculum specialists and our director of state and federal reports, our payroll quotes, everybody's important. If you notice the layers, the higher the, you get towards central office, the layers it comes out. But at the end of the day, all of us are wrapping around our kids and being there for them. And that we had to include our community in that. Because as a superintendent, you have to work with other district leaders, especially administrators to examine the barriers because we wanna knock down those barriers so that our kids can be themselves and they don't feel like they're locked in, you know, whether they're produced or replicated because of policies in place or because of the teachers that are practicing and making instructional decisions, the way you act in the classroom and the schools and the districts, kids notice that. The definition of, san of insanity is doing the same old thing and getting the same results. We know it's time for change and the urgency is no, no greater than it is right now. Well, that's coming out of the pandemic, still actually being in it, in the midst of it. We can't do things like we did yesterday because we know that kids, we need kids virtually that we have to, to reach out to. We've got kids in quarantine off and on, in and out. We're trying to get kids to be reached whether they're in person or virtually. And so that means we're going to have to do all kinds of things. We're going to have to open things up throughout the day and just see what it is that we can do to help parents, to help their kids, because we know parents are working. Not everybody has a stay-at-home mom or dad. And so we're trying to, to be there and find the best fit. We know that some kids that are online are special needs students and or GT students for that matter. We have to reach both ends of the spectrum. And so that means that we have to constantly be be challenging ourselves and getting as much support as we can and working together. Because the way I see it, we're all like pieces of a puzzle. If that, when I look at that circle, I see Berea community because we are like circles within circles. And, but at the end of the day for us, it's always about the kids and keeping them at the center of, of all of our choices and making sure that it's not about convenience for us, but it's about doing what we can for our kids. And that means creating meaningful opportunities for engagement, having those individual success plans, and not just for kids, but for adults, because we have adults that need just as much support to be successful socially, emotionally, um, and maybe new teachers, especially when they're getting started in the field. So we're trying to make sure that we have three to one support plans for them as well. And everybody needs that person that they can, can connect to. Like I have a... Um, accountability partner in the district that, you know, like I said, everybody has to have their have the model. If I'm gonna ask somebody else to do it, I try to model the way myself. We want our students to have community-based projects and that's something that makes them passionate. They wanna do something to change, change the community and make it better. It's always about improvement and giving back and building and empowering others. Um, we have certification programs. Like I said, we've partnered with EKU, Midway College and different um, industries, but some of the big ones are High Street Yale and Hitachi that we, local businesses that we've partnered with, 
Um, we've also partnered with the city of Berea. When I talk about the certification programs, that is actually um, part of our pinnacle program. And we've got that opportunity is, is incredible with EKU that they've given to us. And so we have dual credit, early college coursework and internships and apprenticeships. We've got access to over a hundred programs from OSHA, Six Sigma, leadership to company-based education. And it's all provided by EKU. Workforce development and community engagement is, is gonna be increased because of that partnership. So a huge shout out to them for what they've done for our district in providing that opportunity. Like I said, it's about leveraging relationships in order to truly know your student and get them to the next level. Students need and want and desire connections. You know, it's important to identify, like I said, the key partners and allies to help you to execute strategies, to address disparities and advance equitable outcomes with a focus on systems level work. You know, we got to ask what partners do we have that can contribute to making and improving the result. When we did this bus, we had, we partnered with Berea Kids Eats and we partnered with Grow Appalachia with Berea College. They're all, they've always been huge supporters of ours. We also even at Walmart, we, we reach out to whomever we can and think about it. What is it that they can offer and, we, and that we can offer to get our kids to get what they need? What contributions can these individuals make? Keeping results at the center all the time making the result being meeting the needs of our kids. What do we need to get the partners into higher action and alignment in pursuit of the results? When we reached out to the chamber, we asked the chamber, uh, what is it we can do for you? Instead of say, assuming what they needed, we invited the chamber members to come to us and we asked them five different questions. And then we asked them to be part of teams with us to help us create curriculum for our students to prepare them for the workforce. And they were happy to get on board. And this has been a process and it's evolved. And that's where Pinnacle Academy has come into reality. But it's just actually just asking the questions, what is it that we can do to come together to help our community and our students and our family? Because at the end of the day, it's um, this investment in, in education is the greatest investment you can make. We want our kids to succeed. And when they succeed, the whole community succeeds. And so we're talking about individual student success plans. We want it to be based on the student's drive. And if drive is limited, then we have to open up the doors and provide ways that we can explore passions. We want kids to be prepared to succeed, to have that I can do anything attitude, to have pride, passion, and purpose, and to aim high and always dare to be great because I believe that greatness lies within every single child. It's up to us to tap their potential and unleash it. This, we want the kids to lead. We are a leader in me school district. And so leadership is something that from the time they enter the school building, they start to learn about. We, want them, we have to de determine who their supporters are and let them know who they are. We want our kids to have these um, success plans and establish projects that they can engage in. They do that a lot at the middle school and high school through the uh, summit because that just lends itself to it. But we had to have each other accountable, you know, and determine growth measures to evaluate, analyze, and improve outputs, establishing a culminating project, and to present to community leaders, you know, family members, their their projects at the end of the day so that they can say something that they're actually they're proud of and to let their family share in that as well as our community and so we've had like invited our kids to um, prepare projects and like we have one of the students who's, who's written he's going to do like a series of articles for the newspaper about his experience since school has started and what it's like now coming back from the pandemic and how things are changing and the things that we're doing as we're learning and growing together. And he's a member of the Student Advisory Council and he's pumped about it. You know, I want all the kids to be pumped about what they're doing. Results count, you know, it's very important for success in work and it depends on the ability to coordinate and align to a wider scale. We have to have a willingness to change beliefs and habits and take up new roles, a willingness to challenge established practices and combine expertise with flexibility. 
you know, I mean, it's just, like I said, being willing to think outside the box and make those changes that are necessary. But if it's, if, if it's something that's good, I'm not telling you to toss that out. It's the things just really taking stock and analyzing. Are we doing things because it's what we used to do and because we've always done it that way? Or are we doing it because it's what's best for kids? Because at the end of the day, it should always be about what's best for students and how are we gonna help them? How do you approach your student? I mean, have you provided the opportunity to learn for all students? Or is it just like, are you just focusing on particular groups? Sometimes we get, we might be so focused on the extremes, we forget the ones in the middle, or we get so focused on the low end, we forget the high end. We wanna meet the needs of all kids. When we talk about equity, all means all. Equity is not about lowering the standards. It's about high expectations. It's not about slogans, no child left behind. When we say no child left behind, we really have to mean no child left behind. It's not just something that we're saying because it sounds cute. It's something that we truly have to mean. It means health and nutrition. It means getting attention, higher achievers and lower achievers. And we have to serve all students. Kids come to us in different with different levels of motivation and all kids have different needs. And so we can't make assumptions about students or put them in a box. It can't, like I said, it can't be one size fits all. So you ask yourself, well, how do you approach your student? What is it that you need to do? You know, we, we have a profile of a graduate because we want to understand and think about challenge our kids to be critical thinkers, to ask questions, and they can't be limited to any child. You know, when I was little, I used to drive my mom nuts. I always want to know why, why, why. And she'd say, if you don't stop asking me why, I drove her nuts. I mean, really. But I feel like kids are naturally curious. And, and I feel like curiosity can be a driver of achievement. And now I'm getting payback because Trey Lee asked me why, why, why. You know, he wants to know why. <laughs> Why is this, why is the spider web so big in the trees? And we talk about that. And then we were going for a walk and he sees the bees and they're getting pollen out of the flowers. And he's saying, well, why, why, why are they doing that? And so then we're having like a little science lesson. Oh, I feel like constantly, and you know, it's about explaining something to him, but he's curious. And then, but, but I've noticed though, when we go for another walk, he'll point it out and he'll remember, he remembers what we talked about. And it's, it's so cool because he's soaking up that knowledge. You know, I've got him hooked on science, you know, and so he's always wanting to know about things. And so that's, it's important just looking at that. What makes kids tick? You know, is it, this, do they like to build things? Well, you know, what is it? Deeper learning prepares kids for real work. The difference being when kids are curious, they take ownership and they seek it out. How can levels of curiosity close the achievement gap? Think about that by letting students explore, unleashing the imagination. That's what education's about. And when we do that, the sky's the limit. You know, we think about mental models. They can include things like being judged by circumstances that students can't control. Is that really fair? No, I don't think so. You know, we wanna promote deeper learning in high school with evidence of opportunities. Strategies for schools and families include to me, relationships first, no matter what, I'm going to constantly plug, plug, plug relationships because the right relationships are the key. They open the door to the rigor, to the relevance. We have a curriculum scorecard and we're looking at, um, right now, we're looking at all of our curriculum, but we're taking it like one um, subject at a time. We looked at language, language arts, social studies. We're going to cover everything eventually. So we know it's going to take us a while, but we're using the scorecard to do it because we want to make sure that we are providing equity, you know, and reaching all kids and keeping everyone in, in line. And if the data is ugly, we need to fix it, you know, it doesn't, you know, so, but we have to first, you know, get that information. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, we're examining it and we're also doing a curriculum audit because we want to we want to know where we're at. We just sent a survey out last week to our students, and then the week of um, we're going to extend extend this week. We're going to send out a survey to staff at the district level, staff at in the schools, teachers, and then next month we'll be interviewing um, parents as well as students, administrators, and teachers. 
because we want a clean look at what, where we are. And we're working with the Millennium Group to help us through that process. It's about, like I said, identifying partners and sectors who have a contribution to make. Looking at the data by race, socioeconomic status, class, gender, disability, and college ready status. We're using the persistence to graduation tool. We're just trying to do whatever we can to get information and to help us to create those three to one supports to have the, identify the children that we need to work with even more intensely. Um, we have an anti-racism and cultural inclusion committee at the district and the school level that keeps things in the forefront. We have a resolution that we've written and we are trying to follow the resolution in the, the things that we feel is important. That committee well, it consisted of students, it consists of parents, it consists of um, our, we have a board member that's also on the committee. We also have our, all of our administrators, um, all of our principals are on it. I mean, it's, it's a, a variety of folks that come together because we believe it's important um, to put equity at the forefront. And our audit that we're doing is in four phases. And right now we're in the second phase of that audit. And at the end of it all, we're, we'll have equity policies that, we're put in, that we will put into place and we will fall, adhere to recommendations as much as we can with providing additional professional development. We kicked off the school year with professional development on equity, anti-bias, um, implicit bias training. As much as we can, we're constantly uh, trying to provide tools for the toolbox for our teachers. Um, we've, we had presenters come in from Leader and Me. We've had a variety of different presenters come in. We've had Dr. Cleveland continues to work with us. Um, our PL, PLTs, professional learning teams, are also participating in equity um, trainings. They did that last week. We've had, like I said, district-wide PD, and then we've had school PD. So that continues to be a focus for us. It's ongoing. It's not a flavor of the month. We did it last year and we're continuing to do that because it means something to us. And we're just building on the layers every time we take it from another lens to get deeper into it so that the teachers can see the connections as well as our administrators. And then the feedback that we give to our committee so that they also can understand what it is that we're doing and how it's ultimately impacting others. We've also um, reached out to like our community partners um, like um, Hitachi and, to, and the health department. They also have things that they want to do with equity and inclusion and they feel passionate about it and they're willing to come on board as well with us as we're doing this work. We're trying to meet the needs of all students academically and socially. The needs of kids are connected. Sometimes, let's, let's say a child needs has trouble with reading and needs eyeglasses. You would get them the, the help that they needed, wouldn't you? You would get them the eyeglasses. You would figure out a way. You might partner with the Lions Club because you know they can help them. Those who need food, we feed them. We've partnered with Berea Kids Eats and we've partnered with huh, everybody, you name it. Subway, we partnered with the bar. We have a barbecue um, facility here. We've partnered with them. It's like, we're constantly reaching out. Who is it? We have local farmers. We, we partner with them to provide food for our kids as well as our cafeteria. You know, we, we, we knew that they needed help when the pandemic hit. And so we reached out and we've gotten that support. And we've been very blessed. We have a great community at Berea who is very supportive of us. I know that in your districts, you also have community partners. Just reach out to, to them. Reach People a lot of times are just waiting to be asked. You know, tap those shoulders and, and they'll be right there for you because who can say no to a child, really? You know, that's what it, when you point it out why you're coming to them and the impact that it'll make overall, then it's kind of hard to say no to somebody, especially when, it, when it's about kids. But we have to meet the kids of our students. It's got to be Maslow before balloons. If you want them to learn, you got to hit those needs. Meeting the basic needs means knowing thy student. Know the haven of hope and possibilities. Kids need to be prepared, not only academically, but for life. If our kids get straight A's, but they can't function, there's a problem. It doesn't do us any good. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't, if you don't know how to, to cooperate with others, to follow directions, to work as a team, 
to think for yourself. You can have data, but you got to be able to communicate. So it's important to be to be safe, you know. And our we know that we're living in a wild time, you know. Uh, how many of you guys taught middle school? You know, I'm a middle school person, and I'm to my heart, I will always be a middle school person. Um, I remember having my middle school kids one time in class, and it was time for us to do the rotation. And they were supposed to go to the next class. And they didn't want to go to that teacher. They wanted to stay with me. They said, we don't want to leave. And it was like our gift and talented crew. They're like, we don't want to leave. We just want to stay with you. Do we have to go to them? And, and I was like, yes, you got to go. And like, it's time, you know, it's time for us to switch. I was attached to them and I really didn't want them to leave either. And I told them, you know, that, you know, but, but we, they also were going to learn. I told them that, try to reassure them. They were going to learn as much for the next, from the next teacher as they were where they were in my class. And I remember calling him up. They said, call him, tell him we don't want to go. And I was like, um, I was like, I called him and I said, you know how we're supposed to switch? I said, my kids aren't ready to switch. They want to stay right here. They don't want to go anywhere. And he was like, what? And I explained it to him. But, you know, eventually, yeah, they went in and went <laughs> that day. But I called him and they heard me call him and tell him exactly what was going on. So he knew that he had to, have, he had to be ready and to, and to form those relationships with them when they came in that door because they didn't, they wasn't feeling it. They were, we had bonded to, I don't know, a level and a half. And it was a full class. Every seat was full in there. There was a class of 30, <laughs> but I don't know. It's, it's about having those relationships. I could get kids to do things for me because they they knew I cared about them, not just, and they weren't just in my, they, they weren't just a student in my class. I tried to know each one of them. I wanted to know their story. I wanted to know what made them tick. I wanted to know who they wanted to be, what their hopes were, their dreams. I wanted to know what was going on in their family and just knowing them as people and, and treating them with respect, greeting them at the door when they walked in, you know, and just knowing that they could talk to me anytime, you know, if they saw me in the hallways before school, you know, when we're doing, when there's, when you're on duty, you know, they could come up to me and talk to me. I mean, it's just having that relationship meant the world, you know, to the kids. And when they were in class, having the one that I knew, if there was one that was ever like a little, would like to challenge limits, I would always make that person my helper. That would be the person that I would give a job to so that he was always going to be on point or she because they, they were leaders in the class. It's just getting that hook, you know, them and knowing what makes them tick. Knowing when, when I was in night school and having the the student who couldn't read and was on a second grade level, why am I going to ask him to, to necessarily read a whole paragraph? If I could point to something and he knew where I was at, I'd walk by him and he could tell me where we're at. I knew he was following along with us. I wasn't going to embarrass him. But when he was strong enough and had the confidence and had built his skills up where he could read that paragraph, then calling on him and hyping him up when he did it. But it's just knowing your kids, knowing when they're ready and pushing them and encouraging them. You know, we have kids that have impulse control issues. You have kids that they need that positive interaction because a lot of times all they see is the negative and they're going to get your attention one way or the other. So you might as well give them the positive and, and try to figure out what it is. I remember having kids when I was an um, assistant principal talking to him about goal setting and what my behavior kids, you know, what is it we could do? You know, what is it they were willing to work for? So once again, it goes back to relationships, you know, positive interactions are integral to learning and teamwork does truly make the dream work because then you got to partner with the teachers and you got to partner with your your principals your assistant principals and doing what it is that you can whether it's uh, your guidance counselor or maybe somebody outside of the school it goes back again to having those relationships and you can't uh, kids can't learn if they're if they're afraid they're going to be judged or they're afraid that you're going to treat them differently. Maybe they have a question they're afraid to ask because they feel like if I ask this question, somebody's going to think that I'm stupid or I can't do it. I remember my having special needs kids and we flipped the schedule. We changed it completely, putting my highest, strongest teachers, partnering them up with our special ed teachers and calling them the gap busters and, and giving them that challenge to make the difference with the kids and putting the high kids and the special need kids in the classrooms together. And I had kids that used to be in the resource class and we put them all together, mixed them um, in this particular class. And, well, actually for our math and all subjects, language arts, social studies, and 
the whole nine yards. Uh, math and science instead of a lot of times the kids were traveling in a pack it seemed like uh, you see a, a lot of kind of kids that you'll see everybody and when you're in related arts classes but not so much when it was in the other classes and so we we changed that model and the kids started having a different mindset and I remember one of the special ed kids who used to not want to do his work uh, two of them as a matter of fact and I would get called to the classroom sometime to say okay what is it that is going on, why aren't, why aren't you doing it? And he would, you know, he would think that he couldn't do it. He'd have all, all these names that reasons and excuses why he couldn't do it. Well, when I, when we changed the schedule and he was in there with the high students, this, and one of the teachers called me and said, you got to see this. And he was rocking it. He was knocking it out of the park. And uh, when we were going around, I was going around the classroom and I was asking him, what is it, you know, asking questions about what they were doing. And his partner was a very, very high student. And she was, she was wanting to tell me. And I said, no, I want to hear from him what it is you guys are working on. And, and he told me what was going on. He said, you don't understand. And I was like, what do you mean you don't understand? He goes, I'm not in special ed anymore. I said, what you, what's, what's up? He goes, look around, look at everybody in here. And he's like, he goes, look at, at all the people that are in here. They're all smart. He goes, I'm with the smart crew now. And so he was rocking it. It was all about mindset. In his mind, he was in there with his partner. He knew was very a GT, a very high student. And so now that he was her partner, he was stepping up to the plate because the expectation was that everybody in there was going to rise. When he was in the other classroom, the expectation was that they were gonna, that they were going to rise as well. But in his mind, it was a different ball game because he was he was a player on the field with the people that he felt we're rocking it. So sometimes it's just getting getting the kids to a place that they feel comfortable. Not all kids might have felt that way, but he did. So it's wanting kids to feel safe. And when they feel safe and not being judged, then, you know, the sky's the limit. But like I said, all kids are different. For, for those kids, it meant all the difference in the world just by changing their schedule and putting them in a different class. When you teach, through practice, sometimes it's harder. Teaching is both an art, a presentation, and a skill. And do you understand your, truly understand your students' strengths and weaknesses or the challenges that they face? Do you know what they're going home to? Are they going home to a family where there's a lot of violence and yelling and screaming or, or, or parents are, are working all the time and they're having to be the, the, the mom or the dad for their little siblings? Or, I mean, what is it that's going on? in that household, you know? Is there a divorce situation? Is there alcoholism, drug use? My, the kids in our district, we have a large number of poverty. We have like 70, 73% free and reduced lunch. It, it, that is, and we have a large special ed population around 23, 24%. So we've got a lot of kids with needs. And so you gotta look at things like curriculum instruction and assessment and how you're making it relevant to the kids. What is it you're doing that can excite them about learning? Because they got so much baggage when they walk in that door. We want them to, to have a place that they can feel, feel safe and learn. We've partnered with High Street Yale to help us write curriculum um, for kids that are wanting to be engineers. You know, we want to hear from, from the experts themselves about what it is we can do. And that gives a, an opportunity for them to see things from the educational side and for us to see things for them about what it is that they need from us to produce for our kids. And our kids are getting excited about this. You know, CTE is huge for us. Participating in CTE for us is associating with um, moving kids to the next level. If you see in the picture, we went to High Street Yale and the kids were able to build their own personal computers. And they were so pumped about that because that's something they can use. It's a life skill. That's, that's right there, it's real, it's real time experiences. You know, the graduation rate for those in CTE programs is 94%. And the national average overall graduation rate is 80, 85%. So that, you know, right there is a huge impact. So we're trying to push it as much as we can. We don't want our kids to drop out. We want our kids to graduate on time and to be successful. So we're doing whatever we can using whatever resource we can. We know that CTE and equity are hand in hand. In 2016-17, Black and Hispanic students graduated from high school at lower rates, 11% and 9%. 
lower than the national average. And since 1980, only 58% of black adults and 45% of Hispanic adults have attended college compared with 80% of Asians and 72% of whites. African-Americans compose comprise only 12% and Hispanics 7% at the highest paying middle skill jobs. That has to change. Um, we want everybody to have equitable opportunities and improving racial equity would help to increase these groups access to us for, in participation in CTE programs, we feel is one way that we can help level the playing field in that area and by improving the academics and the workforce outcomes for students. So that data is, is something we try to keep in mind as well. Over the next five years, companies will replace 945,000 work, workers who have basic STEM literacy and 635,000 workers who have advanced STEM knowledge. However, the participation of women, people of color, and individuals from special populations, like those with disabilities, those considered to be economically disadvantaged, limited English proficiency, single parents, displaced home workers, and individuals pursuing programs that lead to non-traditional programs has stagnated. And in some places, it's even declined. And that's not, that's not good. And so one of the things that we're offering with Pinnacle Academy, as you can see, we're trying to focus, we've got business and marketing, computer science, health science, manufacturing and engineering and education. So these are pathways that we're working on with our community partners, with EKU, with Midway College and trying to, and Berea College, you know, we're trying to do what we can to partner as much to provide chances for kids to grow, learn, and succeed at the highest level. Those opportunities for kids to communicate, to think critically, to problem solve, to be team players, to work with technology, and just work on their work ethic and being responsible. Just getting to school on time is huge, you know, and making sure that they're turning in their assignments when they need to, and measuring themselves, being curious, asking questions. We want them to to never be afraid to challenge themselves and to think outside the box, to keep their goals in front of them. We, we want future scientists. We've got kids doing experiments. We want kids to be excited about learning and growing. And like we know that Perkins requires every state to set up, to set negotiated measures, performance measures and annual report its progress to the Office of Career Technical and Adult Education and some measures of the needs assessment focus on increasing the participation and completion works of underrepresented groups, whether it's like I said, in gender and students. So we've got um, we've, our kids, especially our girls, we're trying to push them like girls who code and things of that nature, trying to get them to think outside about getting our, guy, our, our male students to think about nursing, you know, looking the just level and looking across the board at what is it the kids want to do. They shouldn't, if they want to be, if a, if a one of our girls wants to be a mechanic, so what? Let her be a mechanic. You know, we want our kids to be what they are, feel that that uh, longing to do. Let them try different things. And CTE for us provides the opportunity for students to interact with positive role models, and they can earn credentials. We're trying to like get them to have that jump ahead and give them that leg up. We want our kids to have foundation, foundational skills and areas. Um, that are key to the local economy. Like I said, we're, we're partnering with Heister and Yale and, and Atachi, and we want them to have that opportunities for dual credit in the CTE courses. So we've partnered with EKU, exposure to mentors in the, in the industry, people who are really doing that work. And we've got people from everywhere that are doing the work and they're willing to jump on board. We had a fair recently and we, as parents, were invited to come, and when and we also and we also talked about the summit program, and parents heard that as well. And so, parents, if they knew of people, they were able to write down somebody that we might be able to contact, or if they wanted to volunteer themselves to be mentors or to participate, they were able to sign up. And we found out from from just by doing that, we were able to hook up with somebody actually who actually is in LA and wanted to lend their skills to our kids. It's it's going to be virtual, but still we're able to make that connection they, they, in the movie industry. And so it's just by getting the word out and letting people know. So like I said, you, you got to think beyond your like boundaries of your own district and think outside. Increased data collection, 
on ad advanced academic and technical classes, create goals on reporting of data, and just facilitate student access to, like I said, to through their own content. Let them um, see for themselves where they're at and connect with industry and business leaders. I've got a, this is when we met with the chamber and this is what the gentleman from High Street Yale had to say. Ah, if I can get you to hear it, I don't know. I know everybody in the industry side probably has a lot of really common uses for Six Sigma, DFT, lean manufacturing, all those different things. We spend a lot of time and effort getting someone acclimated to our processes before we can really utilize them. So they may come in with great skill set, but it's finding a way to get them acclimated to how to use those within our process. So if there's some commonality across a lot of the industries, it would be a good piece to put into that training is not only do we give you the tools you need, but how do you use them to actually get in that setting, whether it be the Six Sigma, the DFT principles, 5S, all those different things. So if there's that common language of immediately, a lot less time getting them ready to work. That's great input. You were able to use the system against the system you were using already. And it's been like that. That would, that would be about years of training. That's really good input. But the other thing that I'm seeing is a discrepancy of literacy and, and just ability to speak and, and write. The older generation is much better at this. You would think the younger generation would, would, would be better, but uh, it's just, uh, we have to create more and more visual video training for the younger generation because it's much more difficult for them to absorb it in their reading or trying to write it. So that was shocking. So it's just getting that voice and hearing directly from the players themselves about what they what they need and kind of going from there. And so we're once again, I know that we're short in time, so I'm gonna try to wrap things up, but it's important, like I said, to make sure that you keep things grounded in action and that systems are not neutral. An equity lens understands that institutionals, institutions are not neutral and that inequitable outcomes strongly predicted by group membership are signs of bias mechanisms. We don't want that. We, we don't want to have bias. No one is better situated to speak to the problems with NCTE and education in general than the very students and families experiencing the depressed outcomes. Their expertise will guide us in these solutions because that means partnering, listening to people, letting them speak, whether it's the people that are in the field or the students themselves or the parents and the families. And so we got to have an asset perspective with students that cultural differences are perceived as beneficial to learning as opposed to deficits. So when you think of things as, as being a growth, you continue to grow. A system of change is about equity. Once again, we talk about the partnerships, modeling the way, being the change that you want to be, having new habits, thinking about inclusion at every scale, and moving beyond focus groups and, and, and surveys. You can survey, 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 but you got to actually have some action. Once you get the data, you got to make it urgent and see things as a way of, of change. Implement the change. Don't just talk. Have action. Listen and hear the students' voices before you respond and limit the drawings and immediate conclusions based on your perception. Ask questions, seek first to understand before being understood. Introduce those new ideas based on what the students share. Look at their wants, their needs, their values, and provide them with immediate access. When students know you're gonna act on it, they're, you know, they're ready to work with you. Once again, you talk, we, we talked about the partnerships we have with, with Midway and Berea College, the city, the chamber, Hits Barbecue, Native Bagel, I mean, you name it, we're partnering with everybody, Madison County Health Department, KEDC, SESC, OVAC, you know, it's, we're all about partnerships, whether it's KASA or KSS, you know, state and federal grants, you know, when you think about it, when you're a school district, you, you really do have to have everybody because it takes a village more to educate a child. That's just, that's not cliche. That's the truth. And it's about starting with the students and their families. And, as, and this is one of our, another, like I said, I think in circles. So it's another one of our visuals that we use. We talk about deeper learning and multi-tiered systems and ports. 
supports and the importance of exceptional services. Our special ed director is also in charge of our of so many of our programs like ELL and, and gifted and talented. And so she is constantly looking at kids and three to one supports and working with our director of equity on, on this three to one supports program. Yeah, so we've got everybody, all players. We have a lot of grant partners. So you see them listed, whether it's Gear Up, Full Service, our school climate team, 21st Century, Striving Readers, and Family Resource. They all work together to build another level for our kids. And like I said, it takes all of this. An organization for systems change means telling your story, having those platforms there, looking at large scale practices and like evaluating their self, being open and honest and saying, if you need to tweak something or toss it, start over again. We have to develop capacity in different ways throughout our system and the nature and, and the nation as, as a whole. And once again, it goes back to the students and them seeing the relevancy and having a sense of adventure and looking at, at the opportunity that they have to truly be heard, seen, and to put things into practice. Personal relationships are the key though. You know, at, at three community schools, our number one goal is student success with continuous improvement in our work, creating opportunities for personalized learning for both students and our staff and a growth and equity mindset. For us, it's teamwork that makes the dream work. We can't do it by ourselves. One person can't do this alone. You can have all the vision you have, but you have to have people that buy into it and are willing to work with you and go to the next level. For us, it's always keeping the kids center. Attitude matters. Thank you for your time. Remember, no matter the time nor the place, you gotta always aim high and dare to be great. It's important to know your student. This is our anchor and relationships are key to equitable outcomes for student success. Have a great day. If there's ever anything I can do, just feel free to reach out. Dr. Hatchett, wonderful presentation um, again. What we're trying to do is benefit all children. Uh, we wanna make sure we reach out and continue to connect. And again, Dr. Hatchett, thank you for uh, giving us your time um, and definitely sharing uh, your uh, presentation and your emphasis on all children in your school district. Again, thank you, wonderful job. And I appreciate your uh, presentation today. Thanks. All right, thank you guys. Take care. All right. I can ever ask any, if you guys have any questions or anything like that, you can send them to me and I'll be happy to do what I can to help. Like I said, we're all in this together. None of us can do this on our own. Have a blessed day.